Randy Ruda, Chief Executive Officer here at the National Health Council. The National Health Council aims to provide a united voice on behalf of 160 million people living with disabilities and chronic illnesses, as well as their family caregivers who support them. We represent more than 160 national health-related organizations and companies working to enhance access to high-quality, equitable, affordable, and sustainable health care. You know, it's been three years since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the National Health Council remains committed to providing patients with the most recent information regarding their health and risk factors. To do this, we've asked prominent figures in the patient advocacy and public health communities to talk about one of the most significant and persistent questions that patients have. What factors increase risk for severe outcomes with a COVID-19 diagnosis? And further, how can we help reduce that risk? While COVID-19 affected everyone across this country, globally really, those who were immunocompromised faced serious challenges during the pandemic and were hospitalized at significantly greater rates than the rest of the population. So today, I'm happy to be here with our trusted messengers who are here to share with us their expertise and perspective on the relationship between COVID-19 and the immunocompromised community. With this information, we encourage you to talk to your trusted healthcare provider for medical advice and to create your COVID plan. So what does immunocompromise even mean? And so uh, since that's like, spelled out in the name of your organization's uh, of organization, Lynn, what factors might cause a person to be immunocompromised? Can you share a little bit on that? Sure. Um, I just wanted to say, in addition to being part of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, we formed an immunocompromised collaborative that brought together all different groups of people who are immune compromised. So people who have um, primary immunodeficiencies are um, individuals with, uh, that have genetic disorders of the immune system where their system is either missing or um, functioning improperly. But um, there's also secondary immunodeficiencies, and those include people with organ transplants, people who have had cancer, um, as well as people with HIV AIDS and, and other factors in which make people immunocompromised. So it's a whole cluster of people that, can, that really are at risk. So that category really is broad. Does, yes. that, does that resonate with you, Molly, in terms of how Lynn is describing it? Yeah, absolutely. And then of course there's the added challenge of being on immunosuppressants, which is great for controlling a lot of um, you know, the, the symptoms of um, autoimmune disease and reducing inflammation and flares, uh, but that also means that you're more prone to infection, right? And when you're prone to infection, that means you can also be prone to viruses like COVID-19. So it's, it's complicated. Sure. And Harold, I chatted with you earlier about, you know, um, the American Lung Association's kind of mandate, its constituency. People might not automatically think about immune compromise. Can you maybe draw that connection for us? Well, I mean, there certainly is a connection. And so they were more apt to be infected by COVID-19. And uh, throughout the pandemic, you know, as we know, more than 110 million Americans were affected by uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. So, and really the immune system plays such a big, important role in being able to defend off the COVID-19 virus. Exactly. So that's why it's so critical that all of us ha have been, you know, really promoting the importance of individuals, of all Americans getting vaccinated. Right, and having that plan, which we'll talk yes. a little bit more about. You know, when we think about COVID-19 vaccines and treatment that, um, that are available, that we've heard about, is there some special considerations? How do those work for people with um, immunocompromised systems? Maybe Lynn, you could start us off in that space. Sure, um, people who are immunocompromised, usually what that means is they don't, um, they're, they don't produce antibodies at the same level that other people do. So those are um, the antibodies that fight infection, but it doesn't mean they don't produce antibodies at all. Um, so that's why people who are immune compromised, it's really important that they get vaccinated and that they're up on their vaccination boosters. It's n not true that people who are immune compromised um, cannot be vaccinated. These are not live vaccines, so they can be vaccinated. They just might not have the, the same antibody reaction as other people do. Um, and they need to make sure they have a plan so if they do somehow get COVID, that um, they're already 
they've already talked with their physician, and so they have access to the therapies that are available right away. What are you seeing? Are you seeing perceptions within your membership, within your constituencies where people are equating, oh, the public health emergency is over, so this is less of an issue for me? Are you seeing that, Molly and Harold? Well, even though the public health emergency is over, COVID's still in our environment, right? And viruses are in our environment. So I think, you know, our message to the community that we work is, you know, you still have to be vigilant and have a plan, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to prevent infection. And also, what are you going to do if you do get infected? Um, and it's important, I think, not only for the individuals who have autoimmune disease to understand that, but also uh, their caregivers and their mm -hmm. friends and whatnot, so that they have um, a better sense of how to interact uh, with the patient and what their level of comfort is. And so, you know, I think, yeah, the public emergency, uh, health emergency is over, but, you know, it's certainly out there. And uh, as are other uh, viruses uh, mm -hmm. that can impact the immunocompromised. So they, you know, they have to be uh, vigilant and, and develop their own sort of risk tolerance and level of comfort. What, what specific precautions? I mean, you mentioned masking is something that, you know, for someone who certainly is immunocompromised, they might want to think about that, even if they don't see a lot of other people at the airport or on the airplane or wherever they, um, in a large group, may not see people wearing those masks. Is that one of the precautions you might suggest? And is there Absolutely. Are there others? Yeah, I think, you know, all of those precautions that, uh, you know, patients took and or everybody took mm -hmm. really right at the height of the pandemic, you know, masking, social distancing, um, testing if you think you've been exposed or you're having symptoms, um, and certainly vaccinations and boosters, right? Those mm -hmm. things all still apply, um, right? I think it's, you know, for a lot of individuals, as, as Lynn mentioned, it's understanding what your risk tolerance is. Some may want to, you know, continue to stay outside of big groups and others may be ready to, you know, jump back into a social setting and it's you know talking to your doctor and understanding how to protect yourself and what your plan is moving right. forward. I mean for instance you know for an immunocompromised individuals you know, there's other uh, you know, considerations around um, vaccines and boosters. You might need more boosters than you initially anticipated and it can take longer for the booster to really take effect. Mm -hmm. So if you're planning on going to a concert in months ahead mm -hmm. you might sure. want to talk to your doctor about okay what do, what do I need to do now? Do I get do I get the booster now? You know what's sort of the timing for that? Sure. And out, figuring out that sort of planning um, so that you know, so your caregivers know, so your friends know, and mm -hmm. you've got a plan. Yeah, and another silver lining that, that the, um, the COVID brought was broad, more, more broad use of telehealth. True. And um, so I think people in the community, in all different communities are much more comfortable now mm -hmm. using telehealth and uh, at least temporarily, the, the law has been extended to allow, you know, telehealth to be covered more broadly under under uh, insurance and, and Medicare. So um, being able to figure out, oh, is this something that might be able to be a telehealth visit and um, so I don't have to go into the doctor's office as much, uh, those kind of things. And then if you do have to go to a doctor's office to do the masking and to make sure you, you, you employ those, those protections mm -hmm. while you're getting your, your vital health concerns taken care of. Sure. Where do you see family members and people in addition to yourselves, neighbors, others that patients might look to? Do you see them as important influencers or people that we're also going to want to reach as trusted messengers? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right, for sure. Yeah. First of all, all family members need to take the precautions if they have an immune compromised person in their family because if they bring home a pathogen, whether it's mm -hmm. COVID or RSV or something else, they're putting other people at risk. So really the whole family needs to be part of the plan and make sure that you're there to, to you know, reduce the risk. As caregivers, if you're a parent of a child that's immune compromised, then certainly you have even more of an obligation or a caregiver of an older person. Mm -hmm. So you have to worry about what, what are they doing to make sure they're, they're protected, but also what, are, what am I doing while I live in this household to make sure that I don't bring home uh, you know, pathogens and disease that could be spread. 
Absolutely. I mean, Lynn, it took the words out of my <laughs> mouth, right? Yeah. Like, if you're going to be around somebody who's immunocompromised, then you know, certainly you need to take precautions so you're not bringing in viruses or illnesses that could potentially harm harm their health. You know, and I think, you know, for for um, those who are immunocompromised, it's sharing that with friends and family so they also have you can develop a rapport and an understanding. Sure. You may want, um, you know, your friends to wear masks around you, sure. and, and you know, you want them to be okay with that, or or be comfortable with the social settings that you want to interact with them. And you know, maybe you want to go out to dinner, but you prefer to sit outside. Mm -hmm. Little things like that, you know, so you have an understanding and they understand who you are and um, so it, it maintains those relationships as well right um, uh, because you know it's it's tough to deal with this and there's all kinds of social implications of with having it uh, uh, being immunocompromised um, so the, the what whatever you can do to kind of help uh, minimize that and have a plan mm -hmm. and uh, minimize risk um, you know certainly uh, is important yeah and that's not new really to the immune compromise population, I mean, to those families where they know they have a family member who might be at greater risk. I think this message about take that into consideration. Think about that in terms of going out to a restaurant or having Thanksgiving or whatever it might be. Is that true, Harold? That uh, Very much yeah. so. I mean, and that really holds for um, individuals with a chronic disease. So it's not only lung disease, but right. it could be an individual with diabetes or heart disease is that their immune system, you know, can, can be weakened. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it really needs to be taken into consideration and family members are certainly key along with caregivers also. Yeah. And I think the community as a whole in the last three years has been kind of educated more about this. Right. In the past, you know, I, I think if someone had a primary immunodeficiency, they might be like, it doesn't look like you're sick. I don't understand why I need to take all these extra precautions, but now people understand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, another sort of silver lining that people are more aware of sure. how, um, you know, the immune, compromised immune systems right. are affected. Right. So what do you say to people? We already talked about the sense of the public health emergency, you know, coming to a close. Um, and that's kind of that official designation, which did affect different access to different kinds of services. And I know all of our organizations are looking to try to maintain that safety net, as you talked, build that bridge so that there isn't a cliff that people that we really understand that are at risk, you know, experience. But um, from the perspective of your organizations, I mean, this would be a good time to talk a little bit about how you've addressed this within your populations. Um, what resources might exist beyond what we're talking about here as trusted messengers that you might want to call attention to um, for, for the patients, for the, the, the people that are, are hearing us speak to them today? From the American Lung Association, I mean, it, you know, we want to make sure that we have the best current science-based information and uh, the public can find that on our website at lung.org. Um, the American Lung Association also provides a helpline that is staffed by Great. nurses and therapists uh, that is available 24-7. So the public can call 1-800-LUNG-USA. Bottom line is, is that we just need to make sure that we're getting the right information out to, to right. the public on, on an ongoing basis. So. But it's great to have that network in place of those nurses, of those patient, you know, educators and navigators to be able to respond. And I think this idea about having a plan now can be part of what they encourage people who are calling in. Molly, what about your organization? Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, you can you find us at autoimmune.org and mm -hmm. we have a pretty robust um, website with resources. Um, you know, we say that there's over 100 autoimmune-mediated uh, immune-related diseases and we have a very robust disease list there. Certainly when it comes to COVID-19, um, we have a plethora of uh, resources on that as well. Um, so, you know, we, you know, again, as Harold said, we're a trusted resource mm -hmm. and, and we're really um, dedicated to getting factual and scientifically based information out to our patient population. Yeah, well that's so, so important. And Lynn, is that true for your organization? Yes, yes. Um, based, we have uh, primaryimmune.org is um, for the Immune Deficiency Foundation. And we have all kinds of resources on, on that um, website. And if you, if you do a search on COVID, you'll find tons of resources. We have access to immunologists from the top immunologists around the country. So we have a lot of information that is helpful, not just to, for people who have primary immunodeficiencies, but all people that have uh, are immune compromised. And we also have an Ask IDF um, portal where people can ask questions or they can call in and 
um, get answers. Well, that is terrific. Thank you so much, each of you, for the amazing work you do every day. I mean, I'm privileged to understand what that work looks like because we collaborate at the National Health Council. But I think your, your advice today, being trusted messengers on this topic where we find ourselves right now in this COVID-19 journey is um, really critical. And um, we will get through this, and we will get through this healthier and better as a result. So thank you, each thank of you, you for being with me thank today. You. Thank you.